Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Manipod podcast brought to you by Manipause.com. Today, our special guest is Frederick Marx. He is the co-maker of the documentary Hoop Dreams, which Roger Ebert called the best film of the 90s decade. He's also an award-winning author of two books here that we have, At Death Do Us Part and Rights to a Good Life. There are many other books, and we're going to send you to Amazon to get those books. But welcome, Frederick. Thank you. Great to be with you guys. We're going to start by talking about Hoop Dreams. I don't think there's anybody in our generation that has not seen that that uh, groundbreaking documentary. Tell us how you got that and how you came up with the idea to do that. Well, you know, it was based partly on my own dreams because when I was a kid growing up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, I wanted to be the next Wilt Chamberlain. (laughs) He was my hero and he was playing for the Philadelphia uh, Warriors, they were called at that time, the Philadelphia Mm -hmm. Warriors. Uh, And, you know, the guy, I mean, arguably the greatest basketball player of all time. I mean, so, you know, if you're going to dream, dream big, right? So I, long story short, I I felt like, well, I landed about seven inches and a million skills short of being (laughs) Will Chamberlain. So in graduate school, you know, when I was talking with my uh, original Hoop Dreams partner, Steve James, we were friends. And talking about what we want to do after graduate school, we talked about our basketball dreams. We used to play pickup basketball at the uh, Southern Illinois University campus. And we should mention, by the way, that you're what, 6'5"? I'm 6'5". So it, it was not unrealistic for you to think about being a basketball player. Well, I, I love the game. And I, you couldn't stop me from playing when I was a kid. I mean, day and night, I was out there playing. So anyway, you know, we thought, well you know, let's, let's take a look at the, uh, the, the dreams that kids have of being NBA stars like we did, Steve and I. So, uh, but we also wanted to look at the African-American community because we knew that, you know, as, as white middle-class guys, that the dream was going to play out very differently for <laughs> African-American right. kids than it did right. for us. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's how it all started. Wow. And that was nominated for an Academy Award. I mean, yes, well, we got nominated for editing, uh, which was actually I was told only the second time in history that a documentary had been nominated in the editing category. Uh, but it was a big national scandal because we were not nominated as best documentary. And Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel started basically an informal campaign uh, to rectify that. And uh, it, it was actually headlines across papers wow. uh, around the United States that we were not nominated. So anyway, long story short there, uh, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences decided to totally revamp their whole documentary nominating process so that hopefully things like that wouldn't happen in the future. So what kind of uh, impact over time you feel uh, has that documentary had not only not only on other documentary makers, but for uh, but on on the African-American community in terms of how uh, freedom from their environment is obtained. I mean, that's uh, obviously a dream of a lot of African-American kids is to get into the NBA, the NFL, some sort of uh, sports competition in order to get out of their economic situation. Do you think do you think Hoop Dreams has had an, a lasting impact on that? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, I kid around with uh, friends at the club and I say, man, I wish I had just a small royalty percentage of every film that's come out since that in some way imitates what we did, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. whether it's a longitudinal study, you know, following uh, subjects for four or five, six or 10 or more years, or uh, whether there's something about the storytelling, because when Steve and I started it, we had a vision of bringing fictional uh storytelling techniques to the documentary form. And and we thought that we could tell really powerful stories that way. And and Hoop Dreams was the first product of that 
that ambition that we had. So, yeah, I, you know, I meet people all the time. Well, speaking of the club, I mean, here in Oakland, uh, of course, his name escapes me right now, but a guy who played for the Warriors uh, in, uh, from about 2007 to about the, the mid-2015s, uh, he told me that his parents said, you want to be a basketball pro player? You got to sit down and watch this film. <laughs> And so wow. they made him watch Hoop Dreams. And, uh, and that's actually not that uncommon a story. There's a lot of NBA players of subsequent generations who grew up with that film yeah. and watched it over and over and over again. And then in 2014, I think you guys had like a, there was some honor at the Sundance Film Festival where uh, you guys got together again. Yeah, it was to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the release of the film. Yeah. So we actually had the film, uh, basically we, we technologically reformatted and digitized and improved. But interestingly enough, I mean, we actually abandoned the cinematic format that we had uh, that makes the image uh, a little wider and more mm -hmm. compressed at top and bottom and went back to the postage stamp four by three image that we filmed it on uh, because that way people could see actually every bit of every shot that we actually filmed. Wow. Wow. That's great. Yeah. And can people still see it. Where would they, where would they pick it up now and, and take a look at this? Well, uh, the, the last few years, Criterion has distributed the film, so they have it on their website. Uh, but I think it's still for sale, even in DVD form around the country. Um, and, you know, the Library of Congress uh, put it on one of their treasured classics lists. Uh, and so anyway, there's, if you look, you'll find it pretty easily. Well, and for most people, it's going to be... not to mention all the illegal copies that are probably out there. <laughs> right. Larry, yeah, it's you going to be, one of those, right? It's going to be watching it again rather than just watching it for, for the older right. crowd. Right. But, you know, there's a, common, there's a common thread in all of the documentaries that, that you've done. Um, and, and you've done uh, a lot. And... The, the common thread seems to be one of, uh, you know, there's one you did called Journey from Zanskar, Rites of Passage. Uh, you've got a, a newer one, a Veteran's Journey Home. And it all deals with people in need that need help. And, and, and you're bringing to light um, some of these really bad problems like the journey uh, from Zanskar. I watched a uh, little preview on your site at warriorfilms.org, uh, by the way. And uh, it's, it's, it's a powerful message of haves and have nots. And that seems to be a common thread that runs through most of your uh, documentaries. That's, that's really true. You know, I, I credit my parents with bas basically growing up with those values and always being interested in the have-nots. You know, who out there does not have the, the kind of privileges and access to the, the means to basically grow their lives into the kind of uh, success and abundance that so many of us enjoy? So I, I always look for stories of average people who are struggling to get on with the dreams in their lives to achieve something, but keep running into those socioeconomic barriers, you know, those glass ceilings that basically stop them from achieving their greatest potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And you have another one, Boys to Men. That was very powerful. And tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, the, since we started with Hoop Dreams, the truth is that my interest in teen boys really began with Hoop Dreams. Because out of that film, you know, I was less interested because I understood the dynamics of <clears throat> basically the, uh, the, the pro industry that grooms boys from the time that they're now seven, eight, nine years old to be professional athletes 
and all of the people along the way who exploit them or take advantage of them and utilize them in some way. So that part was all clear and done for me. But what the question that Hoop Dreams left me with is who is out there who is actually looking out for the well-being of boys to grow them into the best possible men they can be who's not interested in exploiting them for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. So that's what led me to boys to men, question mark. So uh, in, in the year 2000, I moved to Newark, New Jersey to start that film. And it's all about 15 and 16 year old boys. And it's kind of a snapshot of the, uh, the challenges that teen boys face in beginning to, to cross that threshold from adolescence into young adulthood. And it's, it's actually kind of heartbreaking in a way. I, I actually would love to hear what you, your take is, Mike, on it. Well, I, I was moved by, I mean, the whole concept of that you actually took the time to go meet with these boys and they had other desires, other dreams to become, you know, great, not just athletes, but great men to become professionals, to do, to follow their dreams. And for you to, and I wouldn't say expose it, to, to bring it to light was, was an amazing thing. And, and I, was, I was moved by that because we don't take the time to, to help. And, and you did. And so you need to be commended on that. It was, it was powerful. Well, I appreciate that. You know, for me, in the middle of making that series, it's kind of turned into a TV series, a mini series. I realized I was making a film about the problem and I needed to make a film about the solutions. Right. So that's what led me to what you're mentioning, Larry, the rites of passage work, and eventually even to the veterans films. Because I realized I started learning and understanding that a lot of the, the systems that we used to have in society to support the maturation of both young boys and girls into the kind of mature women and men that we want them to be have broken down. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, well, and in fact, that's also so much of what this book is about too. Mm -hmm. It's about reinstituting cultural practices of mentorship, and rites of passage, healthy transitions to help us break free of one phase of life and to be symbolically born into a new phase of life. So that's really been the theme of my writing and so much of my filmmaking for over 20 years now. The, um, the interesting thing is, um, uh, and you hit on, on this uh, in both the, the video and, and the book is, like you say, culturally, uh, up until recently, the, m most cultures have had sort of a pre-prescribed passage rite. So, for instance, in Judaism, it's the bar mitzvah, uh, which is a little less meaningful now, but certainly in the past was basically letting that 13-year-old boy know that he now is a man and has all the rights that go along with that, that he can be part of a minion and that he can go to services in a certain way and he can wear a, a shawl and all those kind of things that make that boy feel like, okay, I'm now a man, I have to act like a man. And there's a lot of African cultures that do it, whether it's, you know, scarring, facial scarring, or whether it's survival uh, for three days, you know, having to hunt on their own. But it's something that that lets that boy know that he's now a man. And you're right. I mean, it, in, in today's society, whether it's due to lack of, uh, of a, a male uh, 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 influence in a relationship or just, you know, TV or whatever it might be, there's a lot of things that that blur the line. And we're not talking about all the gender issues now. We're just talking about the idea of uh, a boy realizing that he's a man and what that entails. What are the responsibilities of changing from a boy to a man? And I think that's an important thing that you're bringing out, particularly in the book. Yeah, well, I think there's nothing more fundamental, frankly, in our society right now. And, you know, 
arguably one of the greatest crimes of the last 200 years or so of modernized industrial society has been that children are not brought into deep awareness with their fundamental purpose in life, Mm -hmm. that there's something unique and wonderful about each of us. And that's the purpose of rite of passage, is to acquaint us with what is unique about us, what is our gift or gifts that is just absolutely our own. And I love the, the term that Native Americans use, medicine. What is the medicine that each of us as individuals has to offer the world? Because each of us has some distinct, unique medicine. So that is what I aim to try to do with all of my work, is to restore some of these cultural practices so that we can actually uh, reinvigorate uh, our young people with a sense of purpose for their life. All right. So your latest documentary that you're doing is Veterans Journey Home, which sounds really amazing and also is critically important with all the stuff that's happening in the world right now and our soldiers having been deployed for years and years. Uh, Tell us about that and tell us about any new projects that you're thinking about. Glad to. Well, you know, uh, the Veterans Journey Home Project, which is actually five films, five standalone films, uh, grew out of my interest partly in rites of passage. Because the more that I read and studied about rites of passage, the more I realized that that applied to veterans. And here's how. Veterans are stuck in the middle of a rite of passage. So when they join the service, they do the first part of rite of passage beautifully. They sever, they separate completely from society. Their identity is literally stripped away from them and their heads are shaved and they're all made alike, right? And then they go off and they do the middle part of rite of passage or an ordeal, right? They do service overseas. It might be in battle, but of course, 90% or more of soldiers actually do not see active combat. And then when they come home, They're given a handshake and a pat on the back and thank you for your service. Good luck. Not enough. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. What we need to do is to help them symbolically cross that threshold back into civilian life through rituals, through public ceremonies uh, that basically involve veterans sharing like I did with my book about my wife, sharing from their heart the hardships, the experiences, the pain, the suffering that they've been through. And then a beautiful thing happens. Then the public can take some of that burden off of the veterans and we can carry it collectively so that they don't have to carry it alone. And that's what's driving, sadly, so many veterans to suicide and to all kinds of, you know, dysfunctions of unemployment and homelessness, homelessness right, yeah, drug, drug and alcohol addiction, et cetera, et cetera, because the rite of passage is not complete. And so we need to say to them, in effect, symbolically, that life that you had before is no more. That civilian you were, you cannot just resume the life that you had. You have to basically find a way to incorporate the, the hardship, the depth, the suffering of this experience into your new mission in life, your new ongoing purpose in life. And the completion of the rite of passage helps them find that so that they can go forward with a new North Star guiding their every uh, uh, action as they go forward. And it's no longer a mission derived from the government or the Pentagon. It's driven from their own heart and their own soul. So that's what we aim to do with these five films. We show people who understand this and are helping people, uh, helping veterans now find that new mission, that new uh, to light that new furnace inside of them to guide their way forward. And how is the word? Uh, you know, obviously, this is uh, uh, highlighting that issue, but how, how's the word getting out there to them that these kind of programs exist? 
Well, that's part of the problem. And that's why I wanted to make this series is because so many of these beautiful uh, uh, servants, really, of veterans' causes are way off the public radar. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I mean, I need to bring these people to center stage so that we as a society can see the amazing work that they're doing with veterans. And then we can hopefully start to scale it up so that we're no longer basically pathologizing and medicalizing veterans' issues, right? We pathologize them by saying, you have a disorder, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Right. I hate that. Uh, and then we medicalize the problem, right? We throw prescription drugs at them, right? That's, a, you know, for some, that's good and it can help. But for most, I would argue it does not. Right. So at any rate, uh, the 2.6 million veterans who are now cycling home due to the end of, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, we have to be ready to support them as community in ways that are functional that serve them to complete the rite of passage and actually serve us right. because they have important messages that they need to bring to us as a public. And we need to sit down and hear what they have to say. So this is a five part series. Yes. And, and where can we, or when can we anticipate seeing this? Or where well, can we're, we're just, I just finished it basically in yeah, right. June of last year. So we're just in the process of rolling it out. So the films are playing in festivals. Uh, I'm going to a, a festival in South Carolina next week, actually, uh, to show one of the films. Um, but, you know, we're just still rolling them out. I mean, we do hope that uh, the PBS station in Colorado is going to show all five films on Memorial Day uh, weekend. Mm -hmm. Or actually just before Memorial Day weekend. Uh, but we're, we're just figuring it out and we're getting uh, distribution deals and other kinds of things lined up to get it out into the world. I well, noticed let, that. Let they, us know when this is happening, because we'd love we'd love to promote it. We'd love to have you back on and maybe show some clips of it and really get behind it, because it's a very important issue. And 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 this is it needs to be told. And I, I totally agree. I, my son-in-law came back from the Air Force and and I can see where, you know, guidance would have been very helpful uh, to him in, in this case and what you're talking about. So and at warriors.org, uh, I noticed that there are uh, little um, um, boxes that show that. Are, are there previews on there where yes, people can watch that? Warriorfilms.org. Warriorfilms.org, right. Yeah, yeah. right. And and uh, we have a previews of all five yeah. of the films. Yep. Yeah. So yep. we recommend that people go there and look and uh, figure out a way to get involved and, and support both uh, you know, the organizations and also warriorfilms.org because they're doing a lot of good work out there uh, um, uh, for our veterans and everything. Well, listen, we really appreciate you uh, coming by and talking to us again. Uh, the uh, producer, writer, editor, co-maker of Your Dreams, uh, just uh, uh, awesome. And, and, you know, you're, your documentaries just keep getting more and more important for everybody to see. So thanks for coming on. Uh, next time we see you, which will be soon, we're going to be talking about this groundbreaking uh, book here at Death to Us Part. It's a, it's a really gut-wrenching story uh, of the uh, tragedy uh, that your wife went through uh, dying from breast cancer and how you had to deal with not only helping her, but getting past that. So We'll have you back to talk about that. But again, Frederick Marx, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Great to be thank with you. you guys.